have Evan Koblenz. Evan needs no introduction for those of you who know him. For those of you who don't know him, I shall introduce him. Uh, former board member of Bitly Computer Federation, right? Gotta get the names right. Uh, long running member of Mid Atlantic Retro Computing Society. You can correct me, yeah, I know. Evan's been, Evan's been doing it for a while. A book author, right? You can introduce that too. Don't worry, we're not selling any of his books here. That's against state law. Um, anyway, <coughs> let me stop harassing him. Uh, Evan Copeland's The History of Mobile Computing. Thank you, Mike. Uh, some of what he said is true. Um, so I'm director of the Computer Federation nonprofit. This is my 16th BCF. I've run 11 of them. So I think at this point, I probably have been to more BCFs than anybody on Earth at this point. Um, I wrote a book in 2015 called Abacus to Smartphone, The Evolution of Mobile and Portable Computers. And I've given this talk a million times. I've always though it, done it oldest to newest. So to keep myself entertained, I'm going to do it newest oldest this time. I didn't have time to make a new slide deck, so I'm simply going to use my old slide deck backward. I'll be going, uh, skipping around quite a bit. Um, who I am, whatever. I'm going to jump way to the end and go backward. Keep it fresh. Okay. Who knows what this is? Simon, yes. Um, my biggest pet peeve, so I've been in computer history as, as a collector and hobbyist since about the early 2000s. My biggest, by far, biggest pet peeve is the F word, first. Do not use the word first, except where it's insanely well documented. Um, I use a lot of synonyms as loopholes. This is the this is the, so this is an IBM product sold by Bell South, uh, 93-ish, 92-ish. Um, it won awards at the 1992 Consumer Electronics Show. Lose my voice, excuse me. Um, it is a touchscreen smartphone, and as far as I've been able to tell, this is the earliest what we know to be a smartphone. Um, I hope somebody can find an earlier example to show me one day. Um, this was made out of the IBM division in Boca Raton, Florida. The same people who did the IBM 5155 shut-top and the 5140 convertible, etc. cetera. Uh, it runs on DOS. DOS operating system, and it has a stylus that comes out the bottom. <laughs> On the very bottom, there is a PCMCIA memory card slot. Um, it has pretty much all the major PDA kind of apps you'd expect for today, with the exception of a web browser, because there wasn't any web yet. Um, <laughs> the one feature it's commonly missing is a battery indicator. The way you know the battery is low is when it turns off. <laughs> it's like a, a car about a gas gauge. You don't know if you run out. Um, they sold a few thousand of them. The engineers who made it had plans for a better, smaller, faster version, and IBM discontinued it before they could do that. So they were planning a better or newer version. It just didn't come to fruition. Uh, but this is a few years before, I mean, after this, it was really nothing until the mid to late 90s, and this is 93. And we're really nothing else available until 95, 96, 97. So, as much as I hate the word first, as far as I can tell, the original smartphone. IBM of all people, who would have thought? Um, and if you have one as a collector, take care of it, hold on to it, because they're worth a good bit of money. Does anyone know what this is? This is much harder. Do you? Do you? Okay. This is called the Casio PF, like Peter Franklin, uh, PF8000 data bank. Um, it's from 1984. And it's a calculator slash PDA thingy majiggy. Um, some interesting features on the, on the uh, left side. I don't know how well you can see the screen. But there's a memo button, the telephone button for contacts, and the yellow button that says secret, so password protection. 
Um, but the more interesting thing on the bottom left is that it's finger touch. And you see on the right side, it has that grid of five by six. And basically it was like, you know, like palm graffiti, right? Um, you would write block letters to your fingertips to the grid, they would recognize your letters. In 1984, and I was talking to Jeff Hawkins of Palm fame, and Jeff said that when Palm was sued by Xerox, is when he became aware of the product as prior art. Um, so that's how Palm won the lawsuit. He said, wait a minute, Cassie beat all of us by a good decade. <laughs> um, so he's a little gadget. And I, I realized I just skipped the entire history of Palm and Blackberry and everything else. Um, what I'm doing is, um, well, I guess I'll back talk a little bit about that. I have a little slide for that. So in 1993, Apple started using the German PDA. In the 1920s, there were panel trucks. In the 1950s, there were you know, land cruisers. 1970s, there were Broncos. 1990s, someone invented the SUV, right? The term does not predate the art. Um, there have been electronic pocket organizers of some sort or another since the mid to late 70s, and I'll, I'll back into that slide. Um, so you all know about Palm and Newton, so I'm just skipping over those. And uh, one thing about the Newton, though, there were four or five competitive projects in Apple Skunkworks that were arguably better than a Newton, and Newton's the one they chose. There was one called Pocket Mac, a little, basically, iPad, right? And there were three or four other interesting things like that, but the Newton's the one that made it. So. A lot of collectors probably know about these. Um, this is one of a whole generation of pocket computers from the early 80s. Uh, this one was made by the Japanese company Matsushita, which also owned Quasar. So it was sold as a Panasonic or Quasar model. Um, its competitor was the Sharp PC-1211. These are both from 1981. And the Sharp one was better known as a Teddy Radio Shack uh, PC-1 pocket computer, right? Um, what's interesting about the Teddy Radio Shack approach is that the first one they sold in 81 was the Sharp version. Then they switched to the Casio's for a few years. And they switched back to the Sharps. So there were eight generations of the Tandy pocket computer that ultimately became Sharps and Casios. Um, and these, you had a lot of accessories that would attach to the left side and chain together. Um, so little calculator style printers and that kind of thing. All sorts of little peripherals you could attach to these. I'm sorry for the poor quality of the image. Anyway, these are basic programmable calculators. This one was on the cover of the I think it was January 81 Byte magazine. But one thing they did in that article in the January 81 Byte is they included these, the ZX Spectrum. You have to say Z to be British. And Byte meant it in the context of small computers. But if you're tethered to a wall and you require an external monitor, it's hardly a personal computer. Um, and you'll see as I back up the slides here that I stretch the definition of portable and mobile, but there's a definition of Nevis. By the way, if you happen to have one of these or anything of this generation of pocket computers, the screens often leak in the LCDs. If you happen to have it leaked yet, take it apart and seal the LCD because it will leak and it will be destroyed. Preventative maintenance. This is cool. Um, you all know Rolodex company, right? The little card files, Rolodex. So there was an NYU student named uh, Bob Hotto, H-O-T-T-O. And he was looking for like in, well he, he gathered, he got a pocket calculator in 1976, 77. And he was like a psychology major or something. And his buddy was an engineering computers major. Went to his buddy whose name was, escaping me right now, I'm sorry. And he said, hey, can't these things do more than just add numbers? You know, let's do something like that. So they wanted a summer internship, and Bob Hotto's uncle was a chairman of Rolodex. So to shut up a kid, got to keep him busy for the summer, the uncle said, well, see if you can make some kind of electronic Rolodex. Get him out of his hair for the summer. And they did. <laughs> then they made, they had a pattern for it and everything, electronic Rolodex. 
um, and they came up with a little crooch together gadget. And the Rolodex guy said, this is, you know, our customers are businessmen, this is not gonna fly. So he gave them the right to use the pattern wherever they wanted. So they talked to HP, they talked to Casio, Sharp, etc., and Toshiba bought the patent. Um, so this is called the Toshiba name for their product is the LC836 Memo Note 30. Not exactly an iPad, right? Um, on the surface, it looks like an ordinary pocket calculator. But if you look carefully, above each number is a letter A to Z. And then on the um, top, letter, read, write, etc. So it's basically a pocket calculator with the ability to store little memos. And it can 30 minutes or 30 memos, each one being a line, you know, a line of text of like 15 characters. So it's insanely primitive. But it is an example, one of many early examples in the late 70s of pocket devices heading toward organizerville. Um, oh, Judah Klausner was your guy's name. Came back from Judah Klausner. Um, and of course, guess what? Radio Shack sold this too. I forget exactly. Radio Shack, I think, called it the EC 4002 Speedsman or something like that. I'd have to look it up. But so it was uh, 1978, uh, 15 years before Apple invented the PDA. Oh, great story about this. So the guy who worked on this computer, this pocket uh, device, rather, was at the uh, one of the early West Coast Computer Fairs and ran to Steve Jobs. And he tried telling Steve Jobs, hey, I got this cool new electronic product you might want to have to look at. And he said to me, he, the guy told me that Jobs, for interpretation, told him he wanted to talk and not listen. Um, so Apple could have had a PDA 15 years before, if not for Steve Jobs being, you know, holding true to his resolution. Um, Hold on a second, okay. Let's keep it around a bit. This is called the Linus Right Top. Um, the Right Top was invented by a guy named Ralph Sklaru. Uh, S K L A R E W, Ralph Sklaru. Um, it's from about the mid 80s, 86 or so. It's a base station and a monitor with a stylus. Hardly an iPad but it's an early example of tablet computing, and you can put the tablet bar attached to the base station. Um, neat little early tablet. And I interviewed Ralph, and the first question was, how did you find me? I'm like, I don't know, Google. And he said, I've been trying hard to keep a low profile. Well, you failed. Um, so anyway, this is a mid-80s tablet computer. And his plan, marketing-wise, uh, was to use the penis characters, Linus, as his marketing character, but Charles Schultz did not go for that. I'm going to get into something a bit controversial. What makes a laptop? If I say to you guys, give me three qualities that define a laptop, what would they be? That's one. What else? Well, I would say battery power, all in one, right? And like the size briefcase or smaller, roughly, right? Um, does anyone disagree with those qualities? Good. So, this is from 1981, from a company called DBW in the UK. Those are the initials of the, found, the three founders. Uh, I forget their names, but they were the, the last names of three founders. And it was just an engineering consulting company, not a products company. And they got a contract from a water utility in the UK to develop a portable way by which the field quality testers could go out and check the water and everything else. Um, what they built in response to this contract was this basic programmable laptop. Um, the production version had a handle on top. And it ended up being called the Husky, Husky Hunter. And it, again, it's a battery powered, all in one, basic programmable laptop. Everyone knows about the Tandy Model 100, 1983. You guys, collectors, know about the, all the, there was a whole bunch of things in 82, right? The Epson HX20 and several others that are less common, but the Epson was the most popular one. Could this be 
the ball. I'm sorry, but he wanted to be the party too. And a lot of times in history, let alone computer history, you know, the winners, the commercially successful things, get the attention and claim the glory. But this was a year before. Um, keep in mind, as we go to the next slide, keep in mind this is all battery powered. Um, I don't have the next slide, but you all know about the grid compass, right? I see a lot of nodding. The grid compass is a clamshell computer designed for DOD and NASA in 1981. It's made out of magnesium, it's heavy, and it's, look at it, you see a clamshell laptop. It's got a big, wonderful plasma screen, it's got tons of software. They're not, their software was totally pioneering on the Great Compass series. Their software, they had a networking software, and time sharing, and BBS, very pioneering software. But you had to plug it into the wall. It didn't have batteries at first. And the, the three or four top executives at Grid all went on to prominent Silicon Valley careers, became board members of the Computer History Museum of Silicon Valley, et cetera, et cetera. So they are widely cited as, oh, we invented a laptop computer. Well, you had a great software and you invented a great computer, but I would say it is not a laptop because you're tethered to wall power. Um, whereas these guys, no one ever heard of, but the same time as Korea, they had a real laptop. Yes, sir. What was the core part of the grid? There were many core parts of the grid. The software, the display, the magnesium chassis. I don't know what it is. Alien. Alien? Okay, I did not know that. Um, so, nothing against the grid evil. They made a wonderful computer, they made incredible software. Give them credit for that, and give them credit for pioneering the clamshell design, but don't call it a laptop because. It's not real mobility if you have to plug it in. Um, yeah. This is just a Kim one. Um, I've looked through a lot of user group newsletters and that kind of thing from around the country and around the world. And there were people, and not, not a lot of people, but not totally obscure, who took things like Kim's or Sims or any number of the you know, mid 70s single board computers and attached NICADs and made little portable computers. Um, just because it's not a production product doesn't mean it's not a product. So the idea for a portable laptop kind of computer was in the air before Grid or Husky or anyone else did it. You all know about the Osborne. Um, <clears throat> the Osborne is widely cited by people who knew me well and don't really know what you're talking about as, oh, that's the first portable computer. Well, not first, not portable. Um, so uh, if any of you know Hans Franke, who runs VCFs in Europe, uh, he referred to it as a schlep top, which I think is funny. Um, the Osborne weighs 23 pounds, has a five inch CRT, dual five inch quarter floppies. Uh, the top, the keyboard flops up, there's a big handle in the back, kind of like a sewing machine or suitcase. Um, and of course it plugs in the wall. Uh, I interviewed Lee Felsenstein, the head engineer, extensively. In fact, on my book, Lee wrote the back cover of the book, the quote for the back cover. And I read his exact words, but what he wrote for the back cover of my book, he said, I was always careful to tell people that I invented the first commercially successful portable computer because someday, because I, I knew a book like this would come along one day. Um, so one day I was just chatting with Lee, and we had several phone calls and emails over the course of a year. And this one call, he was kind of like not really saying very much of note. And he perks up. He's like, did you ever open a keyboard on an Osborne Evan? I'm like, yeah, I have. He goes, do you ever wonder why it's so big and hollow inside? I said, no, just design. He goes, we were going to fill the keyboard with batteries. Oh, OK. But Osborne was out of business before they had a chance to do so. Um, it's hard to tell in this picture, but the little plug on the bottom right, the second one in from the right, the label says battery. And their plan was that that's how the keyboard would attach and run the power of the battery into the computer. Because uh, all it is there is a hinge and the ribbon cable for the keyboard itself. Um, so Osborne never got around to doing that before the company went out of business. But if you look at the uh, Portable Companion Magazine, which was the Osborne publication, 
there was an ad in the back for a company that sold an Osborne battery. And all it was is a 12 volt car battery with an inverter on a rolling car case. <laughs> That's all it is. Um, so Osborne never got around to selling a battery. Third party company did, but it was hardly an Osborne battery. It was a 12 volt car battery. That's it. Uh, with an inverter. Um, so they planned to make it truly portable, but they never got around to it. There's also the story of where did Adam Osborne get the idea for this shape and form factor? Um, well, there's a lot of theories about it. Lee has his theory, um, and Lee posted on his blog one day, if anyone else hears a better theory, let me know. So I was interviewing a guy, um, well, ever since the Xerox note taker in 1976 or so, 75, was his form factor. But there was a company called GM Research, nothing to do with GM the company, um, although they admitted they called it that on purpose, uh, the cause division. And they had something very similar to this in like 77, 78. They were mainly DOD customers. And the guy tells me that at the West Coast Computer Fair, uh, he had a sign-in sheet at his booth to see his computer, and that one of the people on the sign-in sheet was Adam Osborne. I asked him if he had those sign-in sheets, and he said no. But the story that we heard was that there was a poker game with Adam Osborne and a few other people prominent in the area, and that someone had talked to you know, the, the, the idea was in the air, flying up around. Uh, but Xerox Note Taker had them all in 75. And unlike the, um, I don't know if they have a slide for this. Uh, I don't. Um, so the Dyna book, a lot of people have heard of the Xerox Dyna book and say, oh, that was for good. The Dyna book at Xerox in 75 or 76 was just an abstract concept. All that existed was a drawing and a cardboard mock up. There was no hardware drawing. It wasn't like the Alto, whatever, with the um, Alan, I talked to Alan Kay, who designed the Dynabook concept. I said, Mr. Kay, you know, I'm writing a book on mobile computing, I want to talk to you about Dynabook. He said, okay, but I'm going to give you homework first. He's like, read these three books, then call me. He actually gave me homework. So I did my homework, read the books, I talked to him, and he says, you know, the iPad is the first thing that's even close to what we had in mind. Um, but he said to me, the thing that people don't get about the Dynabook concept he said the important part of the concept was the software, not the hardware. The software is what they built the Alto for, you know. Um, the hardware goes back to Star Trek, right? So um, a lot of things that were just in the air before Lovable and laptop computers came to fruition. And then, of course, Osborne had tons of competition, Compaq, Cupro, et cetera. This is a TI, Silent 700, telephone machine. Uh, they made these as of the very early 70s. And it's just an example of, you know, not a computer, but portable information processing, again, in the air. Um, and if you look at patents and information, I mean, like guys back to the Civil War had things in this. I mean, this is a design that was in the air for a long, long time. And your acoustic coupler, your thermal printer, this one needs some retro run, I think. So the U.S. Army, along with RCA and some other, IBM and some other companies, had something called a micro-module. Um, in the late 50s and early 60s, when you know, TI and Fairchild did the microprocessor, it would be a long time before they were commercially feasible for anything but the nose point of a rocket. And but they had problems. They were making you know, all the companies with military corporations making more and more advanced electronics, and they had a problem with heat and size and assembly time. So the Army came up with a thing called Micromodule, which is a Lego-like block. And you can have like transistor, transistor dial modules and dial, dial capacitor modules, all these different combinations. And they look like little sugar cubes, like Legos, and you would assemble them into products quickly and easily. Um, the Air Force had something similar, the Navy had something similar. Um, but the most famous thing the Army did with it was invent the handy talkie. The walkie-talkie was the micromodule device everyone knows about. But they also made this thing called MicroPack, which is a 100-pound mini-computer, two or three years before DEC started calling things mini-computers. Um, it's in a big Army case, and it sits in the back of a Jeep, um, and it requires a generator, you know. But this was, you know, a 
100 pound mini computer before mini computers existed, things in the micro module. And a little side story uh, the primary R&D facility for Micromodule was a place in New Jersey called the Camp Evans Signal Core Research Laboratory, and that facility is now our computer museum for VCF headquarters in New Jersey. So we have full connection there. This is Moby Dick, mobile digital computer. This is half of Moby Dick. It's a 30-foot tractor trailer. The other trailer is air conditioning and power. So the laboratory I just mentioned at NAR Museum, they had a Burroughs slash ElectroData 205 vacuum tube computer. And in 1956, they wanted one of those newfangled transistor computers, of which there were only three or four in existence. Now, I don't mean three or four models, I mean three or four in existence, period. The choices coming up were Univac and IBM. Even its army lab didn't have the budget for the IBM at the time, and the unit of that company couldn't deliver them fast enough. They said, well, we're one of the top radar and electronic research labs in the country. We'll build one. How hard could it be? So the engineers talked to the bean counters and said, give us money for a computer. And the bean counters said, well, this, this is much, much money as earmarked earmark for field technology. So the engineers said, well, put it in a truck. We'll call it field technology. Uh, and yes, they were Army, but they were engineers like us first. So they called it Moby Dick, Mobile Digital Computer. Um, this is a rendering of it. And let's see, what else? Else? So they designed it at the New Jersey lab. Sylvania and Massachusetts got the contract to build it. Um, there were six of them ordered. The first one was shipped down to New Jersey, and they wanted to send it to Europe. And the Army policy was that all new, army, all new military vehicles had to be tested at the proving ground in Aberdeen, Aber Maryland to make sure the vehicle itself could withstand the rigors of war. The famous uh, Munson Road test track. So they drove the computer, if you will, from New Jersey to Maryland, took it on two laps at a test track. And there's potholes, landmines, people shooting at you to make sure your vehicle could withstand the rigors of war. But wouldn't you know it, both laps, the computer came through with flying colors. And both laps, the truck broke down. Uh, but they figured it's easier to beef up a computer, a truck, to redesign the computer. They did just that, and they sent it to Europe. And it's well documented what each of the six computers was used for. Uh, we have a little piece of one of them, a little board transistor from one Moby Dick in our museum. I have a theory of which one it's from. I'll spare you. Um, one of the people at Sylvania working in this computer was Gene Samet. And she was a protege of Grace Hopper. Um, Grace Hopper led the Codasil Committee to develop COBOL, but Gene Savin was the implementer. And so this was the first, there is a word, this was the first computer that ever ran COBOL. Pretty cool. Um, so that's Moby Dick. And at our museum, by the way, one of our members is implementing Moby Dick logic in a Raspberry Pi. Um, and a museum next to ours is a military vehicles museum. And wouldn't you know it, they have a 1950s empty 30-foot army camouflage tractor trailer, which I plan to commandeer one of these days and build a replica Moby Dick. <coughs> How can it get crazier than that? Go back in time is the answer. So Moby Dick was 56 to the early 60s. And by the way, the, the intention of Moby Dick was that it would be basically the CPU for a kind of a Star Wars-like platform, command and control. So a forward observer would see an enemy, radio, you know, radio it back to the Moby Dick guys who would tell the computer, and it didn't really work, but it was an idea. Dysiac was three years before 1953. Dysiac was two 40-foot trailers. <coughs> Dysiac had a combination of vacuum tubes and printed circuits. In fact, I'm going to break my own rule and use the F word again. This is the first computer ever to use printed circuit boards. One Dysiac ever made as a prototype, where Moby Dick was produced in production. There's been six of them. Oh, and by the way, um, well, let's get that. Um, so there was only one of these made. This was made by the Bureau of Standards in DC, and the customer was the White Sands Missile Base in Nevada. So they drove it out to Nevada, 
And as a test application, they were measuring wind speed and stuff for the trajectories for the rockets and missiles. But in these primitive circuit boards, what they didn't count on at White Sands Missile Base was the white sand getting inside the computer. And that really ended, the, ended that story. Um, so um, this was, you know, again, a prototype portable computer, where what we did was production. So. And by the way, the reason it was called Diceyac, so the Bureau of Standards, which is now NIST, they had a vacuum tube computer called SIAC and a vacuum tube computer called SWAC. Standards Eastern Automatic Computer, Standards Western Automatic Computer. Um, DI, DY, just meant second. Next SIAC, Diceyac. Um, and there's a lot of research out there that's, well, you know, online, about all the injury work that went into ruggedizing it to make it survive the mobile. So this is an analog computer. Uh, you guys know who John Mockley is? A lot of nodding. In, in case anyone doesn't, does anyone not know who John Mockley is? Okay, so ENIAC uh, was basically the earliest computer that was all electronic and general purpose. <clears throat> Earlier computers were either electronic, all electronic and did one thing, they create German codes, or electromechanical and general purpose. ENIAC was versed in both. Only one ENIAC ever made at the University of Pennsylvania by civilians, including Mr. Malky, the head designer, and then customer with the Army. That was in World War II. Anyway, Malky went off after, after ENIAC and used that, and in the late 50s, early 60s, had this consulting company. And his business plan, <coughs> excuse me, his business plan was to sell project management software to big corporations and construction firms and that kind of thing. The catch-22 was that those companies would buy the mainframe if they had software to use for it. So he would go to demonstrate his product, but he couldn't bring a mainframe with him. He couldn't bring a Univac with him on the airplane. And they would only buy Univac if they bought the software. But they wouldn't buy the software unless they saw a demo on the Univac. Chicken or egg. So we scratched his head and said, but I, I wasn't demoing, I actually had to scratch my head. Um, he said, how do I make some sort of portable demo device? Because I can't fit a Univac in a car on the airplane. So he built this 35-pound suitcase-sized analog computer <clears throat> to demonstrate PERT and Gantt and project management techniques to show how one change in your plan would affect other changes in your plan. And I went to his archive at the University of Pennsylvania, all his papers are, and I brought with me Bill Mockley, his oldest son, who's a Cisco engineer, a computer science man himself, <clears throat> and Bill Mockley and I looked through the father's papers, and they called this computer Schedule Flow, S-K-E-D-U-F-L-O, Schedule Flow. Well, if you look through his papers in the Library of Penn, you find engineering drawings, patents, marketing material, bills of materials, interests of letter from customers, everything there is to have a computer, except any evidence that they ever actually built a computer. Um, I did interview one engineer who worked there, who insist that he used it on an airplane once, I think he's misremembering. Um, Bill Walkley and I agreed that this is basically vaporware, that no such machine ever existed in reality. Um, but John Walkley was interviewed by Time Magazine around 60-ish, and he told the reporter from Time Magazine his plan for portable computers. And I don't know if he was pranking the reporter or the reporter was young and didn't quite understand, but Malty talked to the reporter about his vision by about the 1980s or so. You'd have a computer in your pocket and everything else. And the reporter in 1960 wrote, Mr. Malty is already working on this pocket monster. I assure you he was doing no such thing in 1960. This was Isaac Asimov territory. This was not something being developed in 1960. But, um, Malty wrote this, the reporter rather, wrote this piece which is very politically incorrect. Uh, the reporter wrote that the, a woman would take it to the market, put her pocket computer in a slot, and bring home the electronic bacon. Um, but it's period, don't kill the messenger. Um, yeah, so that's Malty Associates. This is a Donner, uh, Donner Scientific Analog Computer. Um, 
A lot of you as hobbyists probably know about the Heath 50 C1. So the Heath 50 C1, late 50s, you know, desktop analog computer, and they produced those in many, many quantities. But the guys who built the Heath kit readily admit that they never dreamed it would be any smaller than that. They thought that was the end of the road for mobile computing. Um, the guys at Donner, you know, they, um, no one ever heard of this computer, but they dreamed of where it can go, you know. Um, so, and again, the same time as this, as Mr. Moffey's invention, Mr. Moffey's invention was quite a bit larger and obviously vaporware, but, you know, he saw where it was going, where it was Heathkit, that they thought this was the end of the road. Uh, but the reason I showed the analog computers here, the big ones, even though they were plug in the wall, is that there were advertisements by Donner and Heathkit showing engineers with these on our laps, and it was as if anyone would do that, which was ridiculous. Marketing got wild. Um, by the way, another great marketing got wild story with portable computing is that the Newton engineers, everyone knows the handwriting didn't work, engineers told the marketing people, play down the handwriting recognition, and when the ads came out, it said, it reads what you write. Um, okay, you all know what the slide rule is in the middle. Does anyone know what the devices on the right and the left are? Yes. Um, okay, so the device on the left is a kipu. Um, the ancient Inca civilization had no written language, but they had a record keeping system, kipu. And all it is, I'm sorry it's not in color, I saw a picture of it in color. All it is is a bunch of ropes and knots, that's it. Basically, it's a spreadsheet. Keeping stock of, I don't know, pottery, livestock, whatever they may have had. And archaeologists and sociologists or any ologists you want to name have found thousands and thousands of kibbutz. You can go to today and buy one. They're readily available. But no one's ever been able to read one. Um, and about a year or two ago, article in the New York Times that some ologist says he probably read one. I don't know. But no one knows what they said, except that it's some sort of spreadsheet. And the different colors and knots and rope lengths in our, are your data, your fields. But the fact is people had no written language. They made a spreadsheet. That's pretty cool. Yes, sir? I don't remember the details, but just a couple months ago, somebody has come up with a, a, it was an actual translation of some of the information. Possibly, yeah. Um, now, the device on the right is a Curta calculator. Um, I forget the guy's name. It had the word Curta in it somewhere. He was a prisoner in a concentration camp in World War II. He was an engineer, so the past time he uh, developed, it's about the size of a can of soup, and you turn the crank and it's a mechanical calculator. And the Nazis caught wind of this and did not kill him because they wanted technology for himself. So he purposely made some bugs in the system and made it hard to work and he made excuses and delays just because he didn't want to help them. And then when the war ended, he got out and went about his life and made the current calculator company. And these go for Three or four grand on eBay, like buying an Altair, you know. Uh, so that only occurred to us on my bucket list because my family was largely in concentration camps. The slide rule, of course, was you know came about in the 1500s based on Napier's logarithms and everything else, and was the dominant computing device well into the 20th century. Um, and of course, the abacus, right, was invented about 500 years before the Common Era. And the first sentence in my book is quick. Name a portable computing device about the size of a you know, clipboard that you operate by swiping, you know, by touching and swiping. The answer, of course, is the abacus. Um, so we've very quickly, in 42 minutes, gone from the smartphone to the abacus. And I will love to answer questions. Hopefully you have some. Yes, sir, Ian. So uh, back to the MicroPack. You had uh, referred to it as a mini computer. Was it referred to as a mini computer? No. Mini computer was a marketing term came up by deck and other people a couple years later. That's, um, what, I, that's what I thought. I was curious. Yeah. Whether it didn't really refer to it as anything but a MicroPack. And it was an experiment for micromodules. Uh, this shows a proof of concept. The handy talkie caught on. MicroPack did not. Someone else has to ask a question. I guess not. Uh, please go to Abacus's smartphone and buy my book. Thank you. Uh, I was just going to say that I don't remember the exact wording, but there was a Newsbury cartoon about the news. Here you, you want to get 
one audio. To say I don't remember the reference, but way back there was a Doomsbury cartoon about the Doom Book, and one guy's standing there looking at his Doom Book, and the other guy says, "Can we meet for lunch?" And he says, "Oh yeah, I've got you." I go, "Oh." I know the Doomsbury you're talking about, I haven't memorized. Um, and the first one, so Mike Doomsbury gets a Doom. He writes something, and according to it comes up as gibberish. Second frame, he writes something, it comes up as gibberish. Third frame, he writes something, and the Doom gets it right. So the fourth frame, he writes catching on, and it says egg freckles. Uh, there was also a Simpsons episode where um, the bully, Nelson, turns to your bully, and he goes, take a memo on your Doom, meet up Martin. And it writes, eat up Martha. So he throws at him instead. He goes, and he goes ow. Oh, yes, that was easy. Uh, but now later generations of Newton, the handwriting worked pretty darn well. But by that point, Palm was ready everywhere. And so there they missed their chance. Thank you.